the biography of the North now. What do we see? All right, they have a population of 22.4 million, obviously much larger, uh, 4.6 of which are of military age. About 2.8 million served, which is 61%, much lower, but still actually fairly significant, but much lower than what you see in the South. Again, they don't have slaves that they can rely on to keep some of the other uh, activities going. Um, they also had about 250,000 deserters, which is 12%. That's actually uh, fairly high, uh, all things considered. Now, their motivations for joining, why, why did they motivate? Well, when we look at the sources, what we see early on, there's a plethora of different ideas of why they wanted to go off and, and join the army. Some was adventure. Uh, there were some gender pressures there. If you didn't sign up, if you didn't sign up, in some communities, women would mail you petticoats. They would mail petticoats to you in the mail, anonymously. If they were really brazen, they would bring it to your door and say, oh, make this white fit you. <laughs> to which you were like, oh, I was going to recruit, I just tell a woman it's Tuesday, I got a So, you know, there's gender pressure, peer pressure. Your friends are going off, why aren't you going off? And then ideology. And today we see ideology, particularly uh, James McPherson has, has brought ideology back. He's saying, yeah, some of them, not a, not a lot, but there was some that, that uh, uh, signed up because of ideology. Uh, if you remember Bell Wiley, who I talked about in life at Billy Yates, he said, yeah, they, they weren't attuned at all to, to uh, uh, military uh, or to the political ideology at the time. And what's interesting is someone's actually taking the time to look at, well, why did we all this, why did we miss this? Well, one was we weren't reading the right stuff. We weren't reading uh, some of the lectures and stuff. Secondly, it was also because in out of World War II, right at the end of World War II, um, there was a sociological study that looked at the American servicemen in World War II. And they found that the American servicemen really weren't interested in the, the political maneuverings that led up to World War II and the attack on Pearl Harbor. They weren't interested until Pearl Harbor was attacked. And the assumption was that, oh, yeah, the Civil War would be the same. Uh, quick look at some of the records. Yeah, this is what it seems like. And so it was dismissed for a long time. But really, the new military history says, no, ideology is important. And more importantly, it changes over time. Now, just like the South, there was problems keeping the ranks built. And so in July of 1862, they threatened, the U.S. government threatened a draft. Said, hey, we want 300,000 more volunteers. If you don't, we're going to have to have a draft. Or we'll break the computer. All right. If you don't, we're going to have to have a draft. And guess what? The states start to become somewhat resourceful. Now, there had always been this kind of idea of bonuses. You pay money for people. You give them a little bit of extra money. And it was divvied up by a congressional district. And so they really got on board in, in the summer of 1862. And big, wealthy congressional districts outpay smaller districts. So now we're starting to see kind of some socioeconomic differences across the country about who's going to come in. Richer districts are sending more people in, although you don't have to be from that district to go in. But we're starting to see a little bit different. Instead of signing up as this kind of community atmosphere, because regiments oftentimes were, were raised in a county or a city in some, or a town in some cases, now you kind of got some outsiders that are coming in, especially in the north that you don't see as much in the south. And the poor districts obviously have a harder time controlling the roles. But that, even that still wasn't enough. And so by March of 1863, the Conscription Act is there. Again, more to coerce people than to actually engage in the draft. 46,000, much smaller, 40,000 less are drafted in the North than in the South. And part of that is because 118,000, one of the things that you can hire someone to go to your place, 118,000 paid someone probably privately to go uh, serve on their behalf as well. And so they face some of the similar problems, but all this together, when you picture yourself in either a Confederate unit or in a Northern unit, you're getting a little bit different feel. There are still regiments that are from various uh, uh, areas. And you know, there's the community aspect, and, there's, and you still have a sense that even though you're maybe homesick, you know, your friends and neighbors are there, and they're writing to their friends, and all your friends and neighbors back home, and there's still kind of that social gossip that goes on as a, a form of control. Because if you were out misbehaving in camp, guess what? Mama's gonna find out. Mama ain't gonna be pleased. And so there was that community aspect that continued on with it. Now, a typical, and this is part of that local thing, that is, it's very local, it's, it's a sense of, in some levels, your community, but as the war progressed beyond 1862, you see less and less of that. Even though it might be, uh, you know, the, the 
23rd Pennsylvania. There's less people from Pennsylvania in it now because of the bonuses and the substitutes. 300 professions are noted on the muster rolls. Three times what you see in the South. Well, part of that is because the northern economy is obviously much more diverse than is the southern economy. Um, but it was an extension of the community in some cases, particularly early in the war. And so that social conformity, I got ahead of my slides, I apologize. Uh, certainly was there. Now, what was the average soldier? Not terribly different. Not terribly different. Uh, he's Protestant, native born, although that being said, that being said, one in four were probably foreign born, roughly speaking, which is uh, over twice as much as what you see in the South. Though, again, it is slightly less than society at large, whereas in the South, it's just slightly more when you look at it as a percentage wise. Most of them are white, although 180,000 African Americans do serve, uh, many of which are in combat, though not all of them, they sometimes play supporting roles. Um, when you look at that, it's, it's a fairly significant amount. It's nearly 9% of the US Army by the end of the war had been African American. They were literate, they were a little bit tighter range as far as ages between 18 and 29 instead of 17 to 35. So it's a little bit tighter, uh, tighter age range there that you have of, of the typical unit. Um, the replacement pattern is fundamentally different. I've already mentioned this, and this is going to become important here in a minute when I start kind of poking holes in the lost cause of it. The idea that you lead a unit down to nothing and replace it with raw recruits, I think, is one of the fundamental factors that had been overlooked until new military history started looking at the sources that they do, as far as why the North has such a struggle in the Eastern theater only, by the way. In the East, they have such a hard time. And there's more to it, too. I think it's not just the replacement pattern to the common soldier, it's the officer corps as well. Now, let's take a look at the officer corps. I've kind of poked at the, the lost cause, and many of you have heard this before, whether you know it or not. The Lost Cause myth started very quickly after the war. It's this idea that the South was all noble, it was fighting for states' rights, and it really wasn't a fair fight. I mean, you take a look at what just the numbers I have on the last slide, 22 million people. There's no way the South was going to win. There's absolutely no way. They've got too much of an industrial and manpower advantage for the South to win. It wasn't a fair fight. But the South had better generals, right? Robert E. Lee, he could do it all. He could do it all. He was like Superman, just without the king. He could do it all. Thomas Jackson, Jeb Stewart, James Longstreet, they were phenomenal generals. And if it had been a fair fight, oh, well, if it had even been closer to a fair fight, the South would have won. But it wasn't about slavery. And this is where the idea that African Americans actually fought for the South, which is you know, not true at all. There's no evidence of it for that. But the idea is that that's right. I don't believe that because there's a number of reasons I don't believe that. One, yeah, it wasn't a fair fight on one level. But on the other hand, the terms of victory, the conditions for victory for the South were much lower. All they had to do was survive long enough, survive long enough that the North got tired of fighting. And they would need to look no further back than 90 years in the American Revolution when a grossly outnumbered and might even call inferior foe to the British one, you just have to drag it out to where it's not practical for the other side to fight anymore. They could have done it if the conditions of victory were there. And that myth really looks only at the Eastern Theater. Only at the Eastern Theater. But by 1863, when the South has its supposed high tide, just before Pickett marches across that field, just before, the North already controls all of Tennessee, much of the northern Mississippi. And has cut the Confederacy in two with the Mississippi River by uh, taking Vicksburg almost nearly the same time. The West, there was a tremendous amount of victory. Lincoln was always so frustrated that people don't pay more attention to the West. That was always the East. Well, so the last myth, it plays on the fact that you got a couple of really talented generals <laughs> and some bumbling that's going on over the Eastern theater, which is, of course, close to both Washington and Richmond. A part of that is the officer corps, but it's kind of a complex story, but again, one worth looking at here. First of all, in 1861, there were 824 West Point graduates on active duty, and this is a West Pointers club. We, not all West Pointers are equal, to be sure, and not everybody who went to West Point would necessarily be a great general, but 
for the most part, we want to uh, assume that they have a certain level of training that is valuable in combat. Now, 640 of them um, went to the Union, which is about 76%. 184 went to the Confederate States. Now, there were also 900 or so West Point graduates who were in private life, many of which were well beyond military age, which is why these numbers are so low. But again, the North wins out, 114 to about 99. Um, and that should be CSA, not SCA. I don't know what I was thinking there. But the, um, so again, the North gets the vast majority of West Point graduates. It is a West Point club because in the North, there are 583 people that are promoted to general during that war or that served at one time or another as general. 47% of them are West Point in the South, 425 generals, 46, again, the most identical percentage are West Pointers. Now, there are many that aren't West Pointers that you'll see here. Some are political appointees, and some rose through the ranks. Uh, you look at, in the South, you know, people like uh, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, he was in the West Pointer, but obviously a fairly effective field commander. In the North, uh, I promised my son I'd had to work, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, and somehow this is his personal hero. People like Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who, you know, was a professor of all things. You know, how worthless is that? And yet he rises up to be a general uh, and, and is there and, and is invited to be at Appomattox because of what he had done at, uh, uh, at especially Gettysburg, but also his, over his entire career. So there is these, there, there is this, um, there is this, this, but those are exceptions. But it's still a West Point club. This, this West Point or this West Point club is still very strong. But the Southern officers, did, they did have some advantage to have Southern officer corps. First of all, the U.S., the North, needed more officers. Why? Because they have a much bigger army, so they needed more officers out there. So that's an advantage to the South. Um, the U.S. enrollment patterns, making new units and constantly putting fresh faces, rookies, out into the field, that certainly was an advantage to the South as well. But more importantly, I think you look at the military schools, places like BMI and the Citadel. I'm just going to give you one example here with, with BMI. There were about 2,000 graduates from BMI between 1830 and 1860. 1,700 of them served, but they served in the Army of Northern Virginia. And most of them are not in the higher ranks. The vast majority of them don't go above major. But they have a technical skill, a knowledge of military affairs, and they're always surrounded by a corps that many of whom become non-commissioned officers as well, of veterans around them. Lee can make all the great battle plans that he wants, but it's not going to mean anything if his troops aren't competently led in the field. And so I think when you look at the lost cause of it, there's a lot of social history there that can be used to absolutely undermine it. Um, the replacement patterns, again, keeping that core of veterans in the field, I think is really, really important in understanding how this all plays out. Now, the Western theater, like I said, is not as successful. By the high tide, the supposed high tide of the Confederacy, the West has already been half conquered. And Sherman's just about to start cutting a giant swath through Georgia. It really is very different in the West. And it's so very frustrating when you hear the, the lost cause myth that you're like, yeah, okay, sure. Lee, I mean, I'm not taking anything away from Lee. Don't get me wrong. Lee and Long Street, they're great. They're great generals. But you know what? So is Grant. And Sherman, as brutal as Sherman has is, been is, is put out there, this whole war was brutal. But Grant, Sherman, Thomas, Schofield, they were wonderfully talented generals. They just happened to be in the West. And they were going against an enemy that wasn't as well um, uh, uh, on the junior officer more level as well led. So I think that's important because I think it really doesn't get, kind of punches gigantic holes in the hole, which is why I call it the myth of the lost cause. The South could have won, but they didn't. All right. So, the most of soldiers' life. Now that we've got kind of this collective idea of at least generalities of what it's like, what did they do in camp life? The vast majority of people really were in, uh, spent very little of their time in combat. Uh, less than 1% of their time in the service would be in combat. Most of it was in camp life. And so, what do they do? What is the experience like? 
Well, first of all, what they do, they drill. Drill, drill, drill. We see players from how much they hated it. Every day they drill. But the officers, of course, like to drill because this gets soldiers to do things automatically. When the chips are down, when your adrenaline's running high, you are going to move because you were told to do it, because it's second nature to you. But you don't have to think about it anymore. But the soldiers hated it. Absolutely, positively hated it. Of course, it's boring. Especially those who may have joined for adventure, marching around a parade ground. That is so not what they were thinking. What else did they do? Fortunately for us as historians, they wrote and read letters. They wrote letters out, they received letters in, and because they were so homesick, they saved a tremendous number of them that these huge collections are now available to us to be able to look at. And so for us, this is a great, great pastime that they did, which they've done more of it even. They would fish, and they would hunt, and they would chase wildlife. Chase the rabbit was hours of entertainment. <laughs> even if you never caught them. It's just a great term. Going and catching fish, because that added a little bit of variety to your diet, at least, compared to some of the fare that you have. Of course, baseball. The popularization of baseball. Hey, what a great sport, man. When you talk about looking at social media, why do they play baseball? They're bored, is one thing, but it becomes, it becomes, it becomes a, a, a favorite pastime. Both during the war, but then the impact after the war as well. Huge snowball fights, which were quite a novelty, especially to uh, uh, some of the southerners that were kind of stationed in that border when it would snow in Virginia. You guys ever had these huge snowball fights, but also in the north there was right. And it would be huge. I mean, there, there's one snowball fight that had over a thousand people on each side. I mean, it was like, I mean, they could drill it all day. Now it's time to practice it a little bit. And there would be casualties. There would be casualties, broken bones and you know, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I don't know if anybody actually died with these huge, huge snowball fights. Uh, this one from Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, I think, is, is just great showing, trying to show the epic scale of these. So, uh, great. Games. Dominoes, as you see in the upper left-hand picture there. And, of course, card playing. Gambling. Oh, yeah, you get a bunch of guys together, and ladies aren't around. Oh, break out the cards. All right, let's play. All right, and drinking. Oh, yeah, let's not forget, even the officers would drink as well. You would want to yeah, pass the time. You could go have a drink or two. 